lovely and darling viewers. It's Jen here at Chuck Her Joy. This time I'm reviewing Damsel Under Stress by Shanna Swenson. This is the third book in the Enchanted Ink series. I've already reviewed books one and two, so I'll post the links to those down in the description below. I highly recommend starting with book one. So this is one of my favorite fantasy series like ever. Like I have reread these so many times and it's actually really hard for me to review this, which is why I've been putting it off. Uh, just because I am so passionate about it and just want to talk about everything. Which isn't great when you're trying to do non-spoilery book reviews. But we're gonna try. So the Enchanted Ink series is fantasy with like a chiclet twist to it. Our main character is Katie Chandler and she works at a magic company. Like a company that produces spells for actual wizards. Like her boss is actually Merlin from Camelot. And one of my favorite parts about this is that Katie has no magic powers whatsoever, which is what makes her so incredibly valuable. Because she can see through anybody's spells and like what's actually happening and she has tons of common sense for being in a small town. These are traits that like the rest of the world like would dismiss, especially in New York. But like for this company and what they're doing, she becomes super incredibly valuable. So the rest of this review is going to spoil books one and two. And probably won't make too much sense if you haven't been following the rest of the series. I'm going to try to keep this first section not spoilery for book three, but spoiling the other two. So, fair warning. Alright, book three starts off right after book two, Once Upon Stilettos, ends. So, the office Christmas party has just happened the night before. Katie and Owen have finally admitted their feelings for each other, and they're going to start dating now. Yay! They totally ship Katie and Owen, guys. So they have a coffee date set up for the day after. And Owen's supposed to meet her, and they're going to, like, spend the whole day together. Except Ari escapes. So they captured her the night before, and now she is gone. And Owen, being one of the big guys in the company, needs to, like, go into work and help track her down and find her. Because having her loose is not great. She knows all their secrets in the company. Um... Yeah. So the book starts off with the two of them not quite getting together, and that's kind of a theme in this book, is the two of them trying, but also it doesn't, it kind of works, but also like the whole company magical war thing keeps getting in the way. Also in this book, we have a fairy godmother named Ethelinda, who decides that Katie and Owen need her help, and so she pushes herself on Katie and is like, I'm going to help you guys and doesn't take no for an answer. And so Ethelinda has good intentions, but basically she makes things more complicated than they need to be. So while things are already complicated, they're also getting complicated by this fairy godmother that Katie decides not to tell Owen about. So chiclet aspect. Ethelinda is like this incredibly ridiculous character that I kind of think is funny, but also a lot of the things she does makes me cringe and ends up making this one of my least favorite books in the entire series. But also, it's Enchanted Ink, so I still really love this book. So the first part of this book definitely feels like a holiday story. So we had the Christmas party in the last one, but like Christmas Day hasn't happened yet. And Katie gets invited to join Owen at his family's house for Christmas. In fact, Owen begs her to go and be a buffer. He and his adopted parents don't necessarily get along. Um, and the fact that Owen is talking so much about Katie has also piqued the interest of his, um, his adopted mother. And she wants to meet her. Even though she doesn't know Katie and Owen are dating, she knows something's up. Um, so Katie gets extended this invitation and she decides to take it. So we also get the charming um, New England Christmas off in a magical town where everybody like is magical in some way and knows about magic so they can just do magic out in the open which is like amazing. Also the Christmas and the snow on these like gorgeous Victorian um, early colonial houses and it's just it's gorgeous. I love Christmas here. Then we also have New Year's Eve and we have Rod having a New Year's Eve party where he also invites all these magical creatures and I just I love how magic and like these normal holidays like mix and intermingle and like develop and like they're magical users but they're definitely still Americans 
Um, I love that. Like, how they're so normal, but, like, they can also do magic. And how that, like, changes things just a little bit. And then the last segment of the book is really boiling down to this magical war that is wrapping up. And it's a magical business war between MSI Inc. that has been in the forefront of all magical spells. They've been doing the research and development. Like, they are the biggest thing. They've never really had corporate competition before. Like, there have been small, local, regional, um, you know, individual witches who are putting out their local remedies, more home kitchen stuff, rather than, like, a corporate entity. And so this is the first time they're having to fight that. And in this book, we find out that Spellworks, the company that Idris and Ari are starting, has opened a flagship store in New York. So they do actually have corporate competition for the first time, and it's a business model that is very much in the modern era. It's very much in, you know, the 21st century. And so they're having to compete on a level that they've never had to do before. They're having to incorporate technology that they've They've used, but they've never had to use it in quite the same way. Like, they, they exist within our modern world. Like, these are magical users that are familiar with the subway and cable news and using the internet. Um, but they've never had to, like, market their magic in that way and trying to shield it from non-magical people also. And Katie, the one who doesn't really know the magical community, is taken on to be the head of marketing because... She's done it at another company because nobody in this company has really had to do marketing. So at least she's done it before. So Katie feels a little bit out of her depth in this book. And she's questioning where she really belongs in this company. Because she's one of the verifiers, the people who can't do magic, who sees through things. But then she's being asked to take on other tasks. I also love how much faith Merlin has in her. Like he has that precog thing where he, he has this premonition thing where like he kind of knows what's going to happen, that it's all going to turn out all right. Um, but Katie doesn't, and so she's just blindly trusting him. Him and Owen both have that. And so she, they're like, it's going to be fine. And she's like, I, I'm not so sure about this. I don't have magic to fall back on. She's like, I'm just human, and I also just don't have the ability to be ignorant about what's happening either. Um, so not being a magic user in the world of magic is also just it's so interesting. It's like my favorite part of the series. Um... I love the characters, I love the relationships, and I love the fact that Katie can't do magic. So like I said, this one is probably my least favorite in the series. The whole Ethelinda thing is not really fun. The um, Katie and Owen, are they, are, are they, aren't they going to thing, like especially when they know they like each other, is a little bit frustrating. Um, yeah, and then the spell works thing is kind of just annoying. Like the threat in this book doesn't seem as as deep as in the other books. Like, there's the big magical showdown with, like, the big duel, and then book one and book two we have trying to find the traitor. And in this book, it's just a corporate marketing battle. I mean, we need to stop Spellworks from just revealing the existence of magic, but, like, it doesn't seem to have the same threat to it that the other ones did. But also, I still really love the series, and I still really love Katie and Owen's relationship. Not my favorite in the series, but still really love it. So it's still like a four, five star, unless we're being really generous, but probably a more of a four star read when the rest of the series is like fives, especially two and four or five stars. So this is like just nestled in between two of my favorite books in the entire series is also a problem. So that pretty much ends my not spoilery section. There are some things in here that I really want to talk about. So if you haven't read book three yet, peace out. I really do recommend it. Go check it out and then come back to the spoilery section when you've done. So spoilers! Spoilers. Okay, in this book we first of all get to see Owen's family and that cottage and his, his adopted mother that seemed so intimidating. Turns out to kind of be a softie. Like she really loves Owen and she this is her only chance to have a kid, so yeah, she that's her son, and she's fiercely protective of him, and Owen just doesn't recognize it because he's Owen and kind of oblivious. I love that. I also really loved his adopted father. I did not expect him to be as chill as he is. Like, he's just, they're both academic nerds, Owen and his adopted father, so they're, I, I liked seeing the family aspect in this book. It's amazing. The fact that her... Um, the fact that the 
adopted mother has a brownie cleaning house for her that is like a secret that Owen doesn't know about is also adorable. Um, Rocco and Rolo, Rocky and Rolo in here. I think the uh, the two gargoyles who drive the um, the car together is hilarious. Amazing comic relief. Love them terribly. Um, yeah, they're a bit annoying sometimes, but like also just really, really funny. And I kept imagining the gargoyles from the Disney cartoon trying to drive the the car. I love them. I love how like they're a contrast to Sam who is so serious and like this like Sam is so serious. He's also a gargoyle, but then we also have Rocky Rocky and Rolo who are just having fun and enjoying life and just bigger than life too. Um there's a side plot with Philip, Gemma's boyfriend, who is trying to regain his family fortune and going up against Sylvia, who is, this, like, we don't know what Sylvia's role is, but she's definitely intimidating and definitely a bigger threat than Idris. Like, she definitely has, like, a line to, she, she knows what she's doing. And then there's also this, we don't know, and then there's also the fact that we don't know who else is controlling it. Like, Sylvia seems to be answering to somebody above her that hasn't shown up yet. So I think, like, she's the big baddie we need to work with we need to fight. Um, and it's not going to be fought the same way as you would fight Idris. I love Ari and Idris dating and their relationship and the fact that they're kind of just thrown together. I mean, Idris kind of definitely likes her, but I'm not sure that Ari likes him the same way. Um, and he's just kind of adorable. And he's like, I don't know what's, what she's doing, but I miss her. Um, and then Ethel and uh, like, interfering with the two of them at the end is just amazing, and I love it. And then, of course, there are also the dragons in this book, which Owen finds dragons in the subway tunnels of New York City, and then he just tames them. They're his pets now. He plays with them, and it's, like, the cutest thing ever. Of course Owen just tames dragons, and of course they just want to play with him, and it's they're just giant dogs to him. It is so cute. <laughs> I love the dragons. The New Year's Eve party where her roommates are also going to a completely magical thing was also really so funny and interesting. Uh, like them getting ready for the party and them having an intervention because they know something's wrong with Katie but they don't know what it is so like they jump to like drugs or something. And then of course the big thing in this book is that Katie gets magic sort of temporarily kind of so Ari gets like shrunk down and placed in Katie's head while she is um, like um, loses her magical immunity so she can just do magic and we get to see what Katie would do if she had magical powers and how she would react to that and how she learned her lesson from the first from book two and actually goes to Owen for help and of course it's it's weird because Ari's in her head, but also, like, I loved seeing Katie having magic, um, and, like, what she would do with it, and, like, getting, like, the fact that she blows up Kim's computer because she's annoying her, and she's, like, I, it would be really funny if she spilled her coffee and the computer shorted, and, like, that's what happens, and I love vindictive Katie a little bit. And then, of course, there's Katie and Owen, just the two of them together when people aren't interfering, even when they're at work and they're completely in professional mode. And Owen definitely goes into, like, I am completely professional and we are not dating while we are working. Um, but also he cares about her. And she likes him too. And it's so sweet. And I just, I love the tiny moments they get together. Um, where they're just a couple and nothing else is happening. And then the ending of this book is so bittersweet because Katie just walks away from everything. She breaks up with Owen, she leaves the company, and she goes home to Texas. And it looks pretty bleak, but I also know that book four is amazing. Like I said, it's one of my favorites. I think it's definitely up there. It's definitely one of my two favorite books in the series. Is Katie being at home with her family. So, hmm, book four. <laughs> I love book four. <laughs> Peace out. I love you guys. And keep reading. Bye.